Good morning and happy Pentecost. Good morning. Good morning. This week is VBS. Do we need any extra help with that? Deb says that oh. they could use help at 4 o'clock this afternoon over there setting up tables. I love the way Deb does her voice. Yes. I didn't know you had that skill. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you that. <laughs> okay. well, you're, very, you're very good. <laughs> okay. So, see who. who, who Anybody that wants to show up at St. Mary's at 4 o'clock this afternoon to help move tables around. All right. I don't have anything else to highlight on the announcements.
104 found in our world. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and high. Creeping things innumerable are there. Living things both small and great. There go the ships and the leviathan that you formed to sport in it. These all owe to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his work. Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. In my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord.
The second reading is Romans 8, 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Nailed that one, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Most people dread getting the front of That's right? why I just took it. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. Please rise for the gospel. The gospel comes to us this morning from John chapter 14, verses 8 through 17, and a parenthetical 25 through 27. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip? And you still do not know me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but it is the Father who dwells in me who does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe in me because of the works themselves. For very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do these works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, because he abides with you and he will be in you. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of the Holy Word. May be seated. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for this day of Pentecost, in which we mark the, the official start of your church as we have come to understand it. Your Spirit poured out upon those initial disciples that fire took hold and moved forward into a vast network of individuals each catching the spirit, building upon the promises that were passed on to us by our spiritual forebearers. So we ask today that you would allow us once again to feel equally enthused and ignited once again to bear your promises with boldness and to have confidence that you are with us, the Spirit is guiding us, and that we are rich and blessed to carry your word near and far. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. Bless, keep, and guide us now and always. In your name. Amen. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of the disciples, on the day of the Pentecost, when Jews from surrounding regions were all gathered together. We have the instance that the disciples were all gathered in one place, but it was a place that was an open air area, so what was happening to them could be viewed and observed by others. The sound of a rushing wind comes, divided tongues of fire land upon each one of these men, and they begin to speak in languages which would have been understood by those who were coming and traveling from the surrounding regions. Now, this was considered astounding because those Jews who had traveled from the diaspora were now hearing men who were known as Galileans speaking distinctly and discernibly in language that they understood. Now this caused a bit of a 
division amongst the witnesses who were observing this spiritual thing taking place. Some of them were so absolutely astounded, stymied that these Galileans all of a sudden had a fluency, which they would not anticipate. And so they were trying to figure out how it is that these men who were known as Galileans, who would have an Aramaic dialect, are now speaking in languages that are our own, that are far away from this region. And, of course, you would have your other observers who were in the area who were not so keen to be surprised at the goings on. And they dismissed these individuals as being filled with new wine. These men are drunk on new wine. Now, Peter, in this narrative, we've come to know Peter, the disciple, as an impetuous character. We could say that he was stubborn, quick to speak, uh, a low information disciple, because he was always quick to make sense of things he didn't quite understand. We've seen this time and time again in the gospel from the transfiguration when she wanted to discern what was going on by building three shrines from the time when Jesus speaks that he is going to be crucified and buried and on the third day raised again. But because Peter didn't want to hear that, he chastises Jesus in front of the other disciples and it turns into a rather awkward moment because then Jesus has to come and counter, chastise him and say, get behind me, Satan. We also understand Peter is the individual who when he saw Jesus walking on the water, he said, Lord, if it's, if it's you, command me to get out of this boat and come to you. <laughs> that's, that's your thing, Peter. If that's what you want to do. You get out and you start walking on the water. Peter boldly gets out and he walks until he realizes he's a fair distance away from the boat. And that wind is serious and those waves are aggressive. And he's like, what have I done to myself? And he begins to sing. Lord, save me, he cries out. Jesus, of course, pulls him into the boat and says, why did you doubt? Why did you lack faith? So Peter is an individual that is passionate, if not always well thought. But in the passage that we have from Acts this morning, we see this, this is what we could call Peter's redemption. That Peter, who has so often bungled his way through the Gospels, uh, missing what would otherwise be a pretty clear discernible point, or at least keeping silence while the mystery is happening. We find that Peter right now, for all of his past mistakes and impetuous decisions, now comes to the rescue of those disciples who are being misunderstood, because Peter knows what it's like to be misunderstood. Peter knows what it's like to misunderstand. So now here's his opportunity for redemption and also to come to the aid of those disciples who were there underneath the sort of charismatic influence of the Holy Spirit. And people are looking and saying, what is this spectacle? What are these men doing? Explain this to us. So Peter, now the explanation that we get from Peter is, is very, it's very important. So Peter comes in. And he says, men of Judea, what you are seeing here is not the work of intoxication. Now, I just want to take a moment here to talk about the whole new wine statement, because as I was going over this text in preparation and anticipation of this message, I realized that so often it's, it's a setup. It's a setup for a joke. I mean, you hear about these men are filled with new wine and make all sorts of jokes about drunkenness. I mean, you like a lot of titters in church. Because what we could use in church is more laughter. Trust me, I'm a big fan of that. But now all of a sudden I'm thinking about this. Uh, I don't want to make the drunk joke this week. It's just sad. So I'm going to make the drunk joke this week. But, but I am going to talk about the new wine. Because so often we have heard that Jesus' teaching was new wine. And he says, you don't put new wine into old wineskins. Because the old wineskins uh, will, will, will burst for the new wine that is placed in them. And when Jesus came to minister to his disciples, he was bringing, well, we have communion. And I present the chalice. I said, in Jesus' words, this is the cup of the new covenant. The cup of the new covenant. New wine designed to change our way of thinking and our way of living. So when the people dismissed the individuals as being filled with new wine, they were making an actual crack on 
these men not being able to even wait for the wine to ferment. Not even being able to wait for the wine to have its season before drinking it. That they wanted to become intoxicated so quickly that they would take unprepared wine and drink it. And drink it early in the day, no less. And then carry on like this spectacle. But for those of us who are, who are hip to the metaphor of new wine, in a way, we, we start to nod our heads and say, well, actually, they were filled with new wine. They were filled with a new wine of the Holy Spirit. So I just want to pass that on to you. If nothing else, if you don't take anything else away today, uh, you'll remember the color red, and you'll remember new wine. <laughs> now, you know what? I can actually just stop right there, but I don't want to, because there's, because there's more to say. Because Peter's got, a, Peter's got a thing going on here, and, and I, I don't want him to miss his, his, his day in the, in the line light. Using the prophet Joel, Peter sets the stage of what is happening, and he, and he hearkens back to the prophet saying that that the Spirit of God will come and people will dream dreams and they will prophesy and the day of the Lord will be at hand. But Peter doesn't stop there. In the portion that we didn't have today, but in the, the second part of chapter 2, Peter goes on to start to narrow his focus. He speaks about the prophet Joel saying that God would not leave us a man. But he goes on to narrow his focus into the man of Jesus because many people who would be there witnessing that scene, witnessing that Pentecost experience, would have heard about Jesus and would have known what had happened to him. So Peter uses this as an opportunity to say, oh, well, let's go back and talk about that Jesus who some of you misunderstood what he was trying to do. And he's doing this not in anger. He's not doing this in derision. He's not doing this in disrespect. He's just basically saying that there was an opportunity for you to have been able to walk with Jesus in the flesh. He says, but that, that invitation still stands. He goes, because the one that was misunderstood in his time went to the cross, but God, being fit and seeing that this man should be renewed, triumphed over the grave and has now ascended to the Father. What you are seeing is the promise that he said he would give to us. And he's not just meaning to those 11 who were there still speaking in, in tongues, but he is speaking to anyone who would believe on the one whom God has sent. So he is extending this opportunity for those who are witnesses to say, and there is still a chance for you. Don't miss this opportunity and don't misunderstand it. Peter skillfully weaves these important characters together because he's making a personal appeal. And I think that as people of faith, at various points in our, in our life, we are always making a personal appeal to others to rethink and to reconsider and to re-engage with their faith at some level. It's important that they understand the work of the Holy Spirit and the invitation that remains open for those who were still unclaimed. You had individuals who were standing there and they were looking at that spectacle. Some were drawn into it because they're like, these, these men are speaking our language. Right? So they're drawn into it because they feel the inclusivity of it. And then you have others who are like, they're Galileans, they're drunk, nothing to see here. They're just carrying on. And trust me, we have all met individuals at various times and heard people who have dismissed the church because they figure that what we do is dead ritual, it's all spectacle, and the church is only about getting into your pockets anyway. They just want your money. So we know, we know about the critics. They had critics then, we got critics now, but that's not where Peter comes down. Peter comes down on those that he's still trying to make an authentic appeal to and say, don't miss out on this one. There is something here. There's a promise that's here for you. Now, his efforts, now I'm moving ahead in the passage uh, a little bit more than what, what Carol read for us this morning. In his efforts to prove successful, those who were listening, those who actually decided to, to stay around and to listen to, to Peter's presentation, they feel convicted. And picking up at verse 37 of Acts 2, I just want to share this, this passage with you. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord calls our God to them. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. So I, can, I guess we can kind of gather that this was by no means a small crowd. So Peter is making an appeal to a very large group of people, and I can tell you from being a person who finds myself in front of crowds every once and again, it is hard to advance the cause. It's hard to advance the cause when you have one person in front of you, much less 3,000. So Peter was on his game. Now in the closing of this chapter, Luke writes, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon everyone. Because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home, ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Note the hallmarks of the early church as Luke describes them in the second chapter of Acts. One, a devotion to teaching and fellowship, meals and prayers. The togetherness, worship, being able to spend time in the Word to discuss that, breaking bread, being a common people. The second point is sharing things in common. There was no distinction between those who had plenty and those who had scarcity. They said they sold their possessions and gave to the common treasury so that there would be no need amongst the members of the fellowship. And lastly, having glad and generous hearts and seeing that everyone was tended to. These are the hallmarks of the early church, things that the contemporary church should be wise to remember and not forget. This is our foundational principles. This is the reason for which they formed and existed. This collective good is our spiritual inheritance, and it remains the founding principle of Christ's church. Now, a couple of takeaways from this morning that I want us to meditate on as we prepare to go into the season of ordinary time, which is the longest season in the, the lectionary year, and it proceeds after Trinity Sunday, which is next Sunday, and then it goes on into Christ the King Sunday, which will be sometime in November, just before we start after. So this is the longest season that we are about ready to start. It's about life in the Spirit. So as we contemplate this powerful Pentecost passage that we, we heard this morning about the changing of hearts and minds, about delivering individuals up to a, a new cause and a new ministry, I want us to just think about a couple of things. First of all, we must understand the nature of the church to be able to advocate on its behalf. There will always be critics of the church. Some of those critics come within the church, but at least they know what they're talking about. And this was and will be continuing tension. You know, we will always have individuals who are just sort of like, oh, I don't know about church and church people. But we, like Peter, not, must be willing not only to speak about the critiques, but it's also important for us to understand what the church was meant to represent and to point people and places where the gospel has transformed lives and communities. This is how the cause of Christ is advanced, showing the positive aspect of churches and that we are part of that gospel, and that's the gospel that we promote. So as Peter was standing there trying to appeal to these individuals so that way they could have the right understanding of what was taking place in front of them, well, he could have sold them out and said, they're not with me. And you know what? They are filled with new wine. <clears throat> he could have done that. He could have sold them out. But he didn't. He says, I want to go online and I want to vouch for these men. Do we wonder why it was that Peter didn't receive a gift of tongue? That he too wasn't caught up in the exity of, of speaking in a different language? Because he needed someone to explain to others what was taking place. And that responsibility fell on Peter. 
So what responsibilities will fall on us when it calls for us not only to defend why we still pay attention and pay heed to church, but what we are hoping for other individuals that we would like to draw into the institution or to bring back and say, wouldn't you like to reconnect again with God in the community of God's people? And this will make a case for me. Most people don't even want to give us the, the, the time and the attention for us to make the case because they have already made their assessment and they don't want to be bothered. They don't want to have that conversation or they want to define themselves as one of those remote Christians where it's like you're Christian when it politically suits you, but in terms of the actual practice of the faith, they're a bit rusty on that one. And so when you call them to accountability, they get, they get kind of real uncomfortable, you know, they're rather danger field in their respect. And so there's that sense in which we have to understand that in, 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 in being familiar with the church, we are not excusing the wrongs that our houses of worship have done both throughout Christendom's history and in the contemporary present. We're not excusing that. But we're saying that we are still apart because we want to make sure that the credibility of the institution can still be bolstered, preserved, and shared. And that's a good argument to make to individuals who might still be on the fence, who've been away from church for a while, who've been hurt by church. We might, we might be, to them, the Peter who stands before them and says, no, the church is not outmoded, it's not through, it still is alive and has purpose and has meaning, and it needs you. And this is the argument that Peter is making. Because he's standing there with a bunch of critics who are hopped up. And, and he's skillfully, I think, given the power of the spirit that was working in him. He skillfully handles and makes what I would consider a very sound argument for those individuals to say, let's consider this baptism. Let's draw in and see how God might transform us if we say yes. And that's on us. That's our responsibility. So that's our first Pentecost promise is that understand the nature of the church and advocate on its behalf. We just have to. Because no one else will. Right? You can't expect other people outside to defend what we do here in our houses of worship. They don't understand. But if we understand it, we cannot keep silent about it. Second, extend an invitation. Now, I know I've kind of touched on that in my first point, but it is obvious that people want to belong to causes. The barrage of social media meetup groups and chat forums that have exploded in recent years demonstrates at least that much to us. However, we know that not every club or group that we might be encouraged to join promotes the well-being of everyone. Now, the church, from its inception, was designed to bring people in on a fellowship in which everyone was regarded with a sense of worth, dignity, they were respected as individuals, and they were bolstered together as a collective good. Peter offered an invitation to those bystanders, and they accepted it graciously because it was offered in good faith. Peter didn't shame them into joining up the club. He didn't say, well, you know, I see some of you out there, and you smell like, you know, I can smell it on you. Seems like you had some new wine also. He didn't shame them in it. He didn't say, you could use a little churching. He says, brothers, this is an incredible thing, and there's still room for you. And, of course, the day of Pentecost is that it was the expansion of the church. Jews, Gentiles, men, women, old, young, were all called to join in this movement and to be a part of its vitality. He did not exclude them. He did not mock them. He explained what was happening and he invited them to share in the happenings and to be a part of this new community. And it was a blessing that swept through the community. The only really thing that we are called to do as people of faith, well, first of all, is to preserve our faith, right? Not to have some spiritual crisis that drives us out of church, that causes us to give away our Bibles, you know, just go and dump all of our Bibles at Goodwill and say, I just, I'm through, I'm, I don't read it anymore. It doesn't make sense. I'm tired of it telling you what to do. So first of all, preserve your faith. But share and invite. That's the story of Pentecost. Peter explaining what was happening and then saying, come on in. 
Come on in. Enjoy. Be a part of this. So we have to be mindful of these things because the only way to advance the future of our houses of worship is to not feel as if there's something that's going on here that we don't want others to know about. This is not some secret organization. Because people who are looking for a house of worship will find one that has open doors. So if we want to do the closed door thing, that's fine. They'll press on up the street. <laughs> or they'll go on across the river. Do you realize how many churches some of you drive by to get here? I often think about that. I drive by a lot of churches to get to this one. Of course, my reasons for coming is just a little different from yours. But, <laughs> but that being said, that being said, think about it. There's lots of houses of worship. Any one of them could be a place where you could unlock your faith. And unlock your potential. Now, I'm not making an argument for you to get up and walk out and leave and let them see you again. That's not the point. But the point is, is that for, there are so many individuals right now who are languishing at home and could be a part of any house of worship. You talk to any pastor, you talk to any church leader, and I guarantee you we, got, we all have room. We all have a little room. So that's why at Pentecost I kind of get charged up because there's no reason why there should be vacancies in any house of worship. Not with a message this good. So we should be on fire. So we can ignite those that we want to partner with us to get this work done. Amen. Let us join together in our responsive hymn number 222.
as we gather for the fellowship of prayer, as I was coming into town this morning, we saw the, the fire trucks were gathered down in Walton in McGregor, and it was reported to us that there was a house fire, and sadly there was a fatality um, due to that. I don't have names and information, all that stuff is still unfolding, but um, yeah, tragedy hits McGregor. So let us be mindful of the family and just that burden uh, that is upon those right now who have to receive this very soon. God of grace, new beginnings of Pentecostal fire. We come to you today, we lift up in our prayers the, the individual who's been lost this morning, and the untimely and unfortunate accident took place this morning. We pray for those individuals who are related, who are now asking questions and trying to sort their way through the loss. We pray for McGregor as every time we lose individuals in a community this size and in this fashion, just really sends a disruption to each and every one of us. Bring your healing to our community. And guide us as we make our way through this season of loss, both locally and nationally. Speak to us your words of power that we will have the confidence to exude the same certitude and faith that Peter demonstrated. That we would feel your nudge. That we would share our findings share the importance of faith, share the revelatory experiences, and invite others to reconsider. Not for the sake of our own houses of worship, but for the sake of the greater church. The church needs advocates, honest advocates, willing to own the mistakes of our past, but willing to project ourselves into a positive future into a future where we can recapture those tenets of the apostolic church to be a house of prayer for all people to have all things in common to meet to break bread to be of one accord may your spirit settle upon us today as we pray for those who are sick and suffering, those recovering from procedures, those anticipating procedures, those who struggle with addictions and depression so great that it's debilitating. respective prayer concerns for the things that occupy the greater portions of our day. We entrust these things to your care today. I ask that you would lay a blessing on our vacation Bible school program. It occurred to us as we were doing our planning last week <coughs> 
orientation training for our counselors that there will be students who will come to this VBS and this will be their first introduction to God, Christ, to the Bible. We realized what an honor it is to be one's first contact with sacred text and teaching. So I ask that you would bless all the volunteers, our fine group of counselors and helpers, that you would infuse in our campers a desire to experience in VBS the stuff of the Apostolic Church, a sense of togetherness, a sense of their own value and the importance of everyone who is there, <coughs> that come the week's end, their journey with you will not end, but that their interest will be cultivated significantly enough that they'll stay on. And they will continue that journey, grow in their faith, and maybe, hopefully someday, find themselves teaching others the wonders of your word. Receive the prayers that we set before you today, our joys and our concerns. Hear our prayers. still moments, loving God. The times when we don't have to be anywhere, we don't have to do anything, we can just be still. And then you break forth, you give us clarity. You soothe, you redirect, you bless. We thank you for receiving these prayers that we have said unto you. And ask that you would continue to work in and through us. That we who are on fire by your spirit will bring that admission into the world. Remember us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
wisdom, time to bring a blessing and to advance causes and commerce. These gifts which we return to you, you have made possible. So we ask now, as we dedicate them to the service of the gospel, in this space, that you allow these gifts to continue to fan the flame of a ministry which will move beyond these walls, touching hearts and minds. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Please be I invite you to join together on our covenant, which is part cover of our hand. We covenant with the Lord and with one another, and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in His holy days. We will strive to be doers of the word and not hearers only, to be firm in faith, quickened in hope, and constant in charity. And we will consecrate our time, talent, substance, and influence as heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, gather with us, lead us forth, inspire us that we too may have confidence and courage to inspire others with your very gracious and loving invitation. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. He took bread. He blessed Offered it to them and says, This is my body which has been given to you. Take, eat, remember me. He presented them with the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant. Christ's blood shed for the mission of sin. As often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death. Ministering to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I offer you the sacrament of Holy Communion. First Congregational's table is an open table. Anyone wishing to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion is invited to come forward when I say so. <laughs> <laughs> and we take communion via the center aisle, we return on the sides, and as you will <coughs> note, there are trays to receive your communion. At this time, I invite my communion assistants to come forward.
redemption. And each time we receive this meal, we receive that renewal, that reminder that this absolution that you have provided is real. It is tangible. We need that reminder. And that is the reminder that we will sell to others as often as possible so they too can know that redemption is not just a talking point, it is the real deal. Thank you. Let us join together in our closing hymn number 500. <laughs>